Welcome. In this video, we will look at the creation and accessing of classes and objects using the PowerBasic console compiler. In the videos we've done up until now, we have used quite traditional functions and subroutines to create our application. In this video, we're going to use classes. PowerBasic is quite flexible in that it allows you to either write your code in classes or in subroutines and functions or in a mixture of both. In this application, we're going to include a small macros include file. This include file is going to contain two macros. One to prepare our console and one to wait at the end of the program for the user to press a button to exit the console. So we can quite easily call them in here. And this prepares our console for use. If we run this program now, it will create the console and wait for a key to be pressed. Now, we're going to create a class. We're going to put this class in its own encode file. So we will create an encode file just for the class. The beginning and the end of the class. Now we will save this. And we will call this demo class. And we will include this at the top of the program. So, what's our class actually going to do? So, in order to use our class, there's a few things we need to set up. Inside the uh, class definition, we'll want to have some storage, some variables which can actually contain all the information we're after. So these three instance variables, the first being an array and the other two being strings, are created for use within the class. The whole point of class programming is that you deal with the objects and the interface to those objects, really abstracting all the code away from the thing that calls the code. Now, there are a couple of things we'll actually set up for the class, which although we're not going to use them here, we'll mention them. These are the creation and the destructor parts of the class. If there's anything that needs to be set up when the class is created, it will go in here and anything that needs to be destroyed after the class is actually finished up with would go in here. Now in this particular program I'm not going to be using these but the other thing we'll need to do is we'll need to define uh, the interface by how we actually connect to this class. Again, we have an interface and an end interface. We've actually named the interface here is iDaysArray. As we did in our last video, we're basically going to be creating an array which will contain days of the week. So all our interface code will appear between these two lines, the beginning and the end of the interface. Now, if we go back to our code, right at the beginning, what we want to do is we want to create our local variables, which are going to reference our objects, which are going to reference the class. So we will create an object. For the purposes of doing things in a class, we don't need to know what the name of the actual array is, just its object. Right, now we've created the object that's going to be our connection into the uh, class. Uh, we specified its interface name, which we defined up here, 
of interface name. Um, we are instantiating the object days away, and days away is the name of the class. So, having done that, we would expect to create our object. Now, let's finish off the interface. The interface in this case is going to inherit from a base class. In this case, I unknown. Once you have a fair number of classes built up, you can actually inherit from other classes which you have already created. Now, that compiles quite cleanly, so we haven't done anything wrong so far, which is really good. So the next thing to do is, if we run this code, this would instantiate a class. Now, the one thing you want to test to make sure that the class has actually been referenced is to test it. So the is object will actually tell us whether the class has been successfully instantiated into this object or not. So if it gets down to here, then it has been successfully created. So if it hasn't been created, we want to throw a message out to the user, basically just to tell them that there's been a problem. And just as positive confirmation, So if we run this now, it would come up to say created object. If for some reason we had got the class name wrong, it would tell us it couldn't create the object. So that's the basis of our class. Now the class doesn't actually do anything yet. We want to give it some work. Now, one of the things we've actually created in our class is we've created an ability to give a name, basically, to the array. So we'll want to create that first. So we do this by setting properties. So if we go into the interface, and we'll put in a property, this will be the get for the property to let us get the value and it will return what is stored in the array name variable. Now we'll need a property to set the value and we'll be passing this one a parameter and in this one it's quite straightforward. So we have a method for actually getting the array name and setting the array name. Now back in our code in our main module we want to use the array name to actually set it. So once we're sure the object has indeed been created, we can go in and we can reference the object like so. And to be sure that this has actually saved this value into that, we can actually print out the value we've actually put into it. So if we try running this now, uh, it's printed out my simple days array, which is the value we put into the property of that class. So, so far so good. So if we want to store something in the actual array itself, how do we do that? Well, if we look at a class, we have set the array up in here, and we'll want something to actually take that in as a value. So again, we're talking another couple of uh, properties. So we haven't actually dimensioned this array yet. So the next thing we'll want to do before we actually put anything into or take anything out of the array is set up the size of the array. Now, we want to set the bounding of the array, so we'll need a, a method inside the class to actually perform this. So 
So we're going to create a method called set bounds, and we're going to give it two parameters, the low value of the array and the high value. As in the previous video, we're going to start at the zero element and work up to the six element. Again, still inside the uh, interface. So as we saw before, we're giving two parameters. We're wanting the lower bounding and the high bounding. And we can use the readm command, which we've used in previous videos, on our array. to redimension it. So, having done that, let's just try compiling, make sure we've got everything. Yes, we're fine. So this should actually set the bounding of the array between 0 and 6. And then we can look at putting some values into it. So let's try putting some code in there to ensure that what we're putting into this class is actually being recorded inside there. So we're going to use the day name property to pull back the value that's actually stored in here. Now we haven't set it yet, but we're going to be setting it in a moment. So how do we actually set the value? Well, we'll use exactly the same construct. And set the day name. Let's see if this gets back the values we've put into the class. There we go. It's confirming it's created the object. It's bringing back the name of the array we gave it. And it's also bringing back the value Sunday, which we put into the zero element of the array. So we want to do that for all days of the week. I'll just push out a blank line and we'll put in a little loop. So we'll create a new local variable. And inside the loop, we're actually going to put in call to day name to set it for each of them. Now to be sure that's actually put the information in, we will get the information back out again. Let's try that now. There we go. It's put Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. So we've put the information into the array inside the class and it's extracted the information back out. However, we haven't put much in the way of error handling inside the class, which we should really do. Although we know exactly how big the array is in our own code here, if someone else had actually written the class, um, we may not have much knowledge of what goes on inside the class. All we love knowledge of is the interface, so it's always good to test everything. So in our class, we have no error handling and we need to set some up. So what we'll do is we're going to put in a test on the bounding. So we're going to do this as a method outside of the interface. So above the interface, we're going to put another method in and we're going to call this method test bounds. If you lose track of the code within your class, the F2 button on the keyboard will bring up a list of all the methods, properties, both set and get you've actually got inside your code. So you can quite easily jump directly to the one you're after, just like you did with functions and subroutines. So what this is going to do, this is going to test the bounding of our arrays using the u-bound command, which we've used before, and the l-bound command to check the upper and the lower boundings of an array. 
and it's going to populate this variable we defined at the beginning called airstring um, so we can actually get a message coming back so how do we actually use that within our calls to day name we're passing a number and that number is the element within the array so what we need to do we need to test to make sure that the bounding has not exceeded that so the easiest way to do that is to put a test around it so if the test bound comes back with a zero then we'll accept the property and exactly the same line of code we will put in to our set day name just to make sure we don't attempt to write beyond the end of the array now that's fine but how are we actually going to actually use that in our code well when we actually set the value everything we've done so far has been within the bounds of the array if we attempt to go beyond the bounds of the array and actually do something beyond it for example if we try and do this and use the seventh element of the array which we know does not exist and try and put a value into there what's going to happen well we need to test the value of error status So what we've done here is we're putting or attempting to put a value into the seventh element of the array which does not exist. Uh, we're testing the error status. If the error status actually comes back with a value we will print out the string that's hiding in the error message. So we need to actually create this method error status. So we go back to our class and we will put in a couple of new methods. Now we know that the error string can, will contain a value if there is actually an error that has occurred. So all we're going to use here, we're going to use the len command, which is a string function that returns the length of a string. So if the error string contains actually nothing, then it will be zero. Anything other than that will be containing some kind of error. And the final method to tell us what the message actually is. Now we are calling on this report error. This is what's going to actually throw back a message. So we need yet another method outside the interface. I'll put this one in here and this is the one which will actually report and since we know what the array name is using the CRLF uh, reserved string which is a cabbage return line feed basically to put a new line into our text and we'll append on the end the error string right okay now hopefully that should be us there we go so it has created the object put the value of my simple days array into the name of the array we put the value Sunday into the first element we've run through each of the days of the week and put that into the array and we've attempted to put a seventh element which is above the current maximum of six of the array and we've generated error message which at the moment is just going on screen but it could go anywhere um, to see what the name of the object is we're actually trying to address what we're attempting to do and why it's actually failed. So that completes our simplistic view 
of classes within Power Basic. There is much more that can be done in classes, but we'll do that in a later video. Thank you for watching.